I was going to take a global view, look at global food security issues, uh, thinking about the uh, Millennium, or now the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, um, where hunger and malnutrition are right up there on the top. And um, I think it's worth remembering that uh, uh, nearly 30% of the world's workforce are poor farmers, so they are um, very much uh, dependent on, well, raising them out of poverty is very much dependent on the fortunes of agriculture globally. Uh, they're also uh, two thirds of the world's poor in rural areas of uh, developing countries. So it's in that context that I was going to look at these global issues. Um, it's true that uh, malnutrition uh, has come down a lot in the world, but it's still very high and has not been coming down much in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, nor in uh, South Asia, despite all the things that Ashok's been talking about. But uh, it was very uh, inspiring to hear about those innovations going on there at the moment that hopefully are going to lift uh, India uh, much more out of poverty over coming decades. Uh, so the question is whether we can feed these 8.5 uh, billion people will have here by the end of the next decade. Um, and uh, increasing the productivity of resources, as Ashok mentioned, is obviously uh, one way to do that. But typically the types of research that we've been doing, uh, such as in um, seeds, takes decades to have its full effect. So um, that's why I'm focusing, I guess, on, um, on trade, because that can speed that, uh, that up somewhat. Um, and as well, public investment in agricultural R&D has not been growing relative to agricultural uh, GDP, um, and that's at a time when climate change is actually requiring more rather than less of that sort of research. Um, so let's uh, think about what's been happening in the way of uh, agricultural uh, price distorting policies and whether we can uh, feed people more by improving on those. It is exactly 200 years since David Ricardo uh, wrote his uh, book on uh, comparative advantage. And the Brits, of course, picked up on that with their repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846 and subsequently uh, reopening trade first with France from 1860. And that opened up uh, trade in Western Europe generally. And we saw a big reduction in agricultural protection uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. So let me talk briefly about that distant past, not because history uh, is interesting for its own sake, but it actually has relevance to where we are today. Uh, and then say something about our recent past and then the, the future. So uh, in the past, agriculture trade hasn't really had much of a role other than in inputs, trading seeds, trading breeding animals, trading technologies. But the cost of trading final products was always too high until around the, uh, um, the 19th century when um, uh, shipping costs came down with uh, steam engines, steel hulls, uh, refrigeration and uh, the telegraph, for example. And so the initial trade in those uh, early uh, years of international trade in farm products was fibres. Uh, that was because Britain's biggest industry was textiles. Uh, and so they were purchasing cotton from the US, wool from us, and so on. And during that period of rapid industrialisation in the UK, uh, the peripheral countries that included the New World countries uh, were um, uh, improving their, they were seeing their terms of trade improve um, and uh, the urbanisation of, uh, of England and then Europe also led to uh, food imports. So we had this big improvement in the terms of trade for primary exporting countries. Um, the UK was lowering the international price of manufacturers and raising the international price of primary products. And that certainly is what we've been seeing, haven't we, in recent decades with the growth of uh, China, the same type of thing. Um, and so the, uh, the trade in uh, both agricultural and non-agricultural products grew at 3.5% a year uh, from the mid-1800s through to the First World War. They both fell uh, during the uh, interwar period, uh, but it meant that by the end of that interwar period, the uh, share of agriculture in uh, global trade was still about uh, 50%. Um, so that's that terms of trade uh, uh, change there, the increase for, uh, uh, in dark in the, for the uh, uh, primary exporting countries and the decrease in the uh, prices of uh, products being exported from the UK. So turning then to the, the um, recent uh, period since 1920, uh, we saw a reversal of that improvement in terms of trade for primary producers uh, with a real decline in both food and non-food agricultural product prices 
throughout the, uh, the 20th century. And that was uh, for two reasons. One was the increasing productivity, which is the theme of this conference this year, uh, that ensured that supplies expanded faster than global demand. And that's been happening in India too, as we saw from Ashok slides earlier, and of course also in China for several decades after it began to open up. But the other thing that's uh, been bringing down those prices in this past century has been the growth of agricultural protectionism in the high income countries. Um, and uh, that is, uh, uh, was offset somewhat by anti-agricultural policy biases in developing countries, but not sufficiently. Um, that agricultural protection growth in the rich countries and the anti-agricultural uh, policy bias in developing countries had three very important impacts in that past century. Uh, it shrunk agriculture's share of uh, global trade. Uh, it um, uh, sh slowed the rise in the share of agricultural output that was exported. Uh, and it thinned international uh, food markets. And so they were very much more volatile than they otherwise would have been. So there's the decline in the share of agriculture in global goods trade from 50% down to about 7 or 8% today. Um, and uh, those, uh, those features um, for high income countries, they were using these variable import restrictions and variable export subsidies so that both protected and insulated uh, those farmers from international food markets. Uh, while in the developing countries, they were using variable ex agricultural export restrictions plus overvalued exchange rates and manufacturing import tariffs. Um, and both of these uh, sets of policies were slowing agriculture's globalisation and both were lowering the farm incomes uh, in developing countries where our poorest people in the world live. But we've had this massive re uh, reform since the mid 80s. There's been this big reduction in farm supports in many high income countries and we captured that in a World Bank project a few years ago by measuring the nominal rate of assistance to farmers, the extent to which their prices are above what they otherwise would have been. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, price distortion trend was one of uh, rising distortions in the first half of the period shown there, and then an equally, large, uh, equally rapid decline in those distortions in high income countries now to levels below what they were in 1960 as the European uh, economic community started to kick in. Um, in the developing countries, we've seen this big reduction in export taxation. Uh, the average export taxation in developing countries was 50%. Uh, it was an extraordinary for a couple of decades after their independence in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but they've also lowered their manufacturing protectionism. That's happened in India as well. Ashok was the Indian author in that project. Uh, the World Bank had and showed the extent to which that contributed to the improvement in the relative price of farm products versus manufacturers in India and helped them to uh, expand their agricultural sector. So you can see there the average nominal rate of assistance in developing countries in the 60s and 70s was uh, at the order of minus 25 per cent and then we've had this huge transformation where it's now positive. Um, so that line in five-year averages is the middle of those lines there, and you can see how it's gone from minus 25 to plus a bit. Uh, the upper line there is manufacturing protectionism in developing countries, and when you take both into account and get the relative rate of assistance to agriculture, it's that dotted line below, going from minus 50% to zero. So a huge improvement in the incentives faced by farmers in developing countries thanks to those policy reforms. You might think, well, where does Australia look in all of that? Because we also, like developing countries, were very manufacturing protectionist and we didn't support farmers very much. There was a bit of support for them. Um, so here's that same set of lines for Australia. Thanks to Peter Lloyd, he did this work uh, recently, uh, back to Federation, and you can see how agriculture was squeezed in Australia relative to manufacturing over most of our history until the reforms of the 1980s. So we've had this convergence now in average rates of assistance to farmers in rich versus poor countries, and both are close to zero now on aggregate. But those lines do hide a huge amount of uh, variation. So let me just quickly run through, you'll think 10 minutes is, uh, 10 questions is a lot, but I'll have less than a minute on each and we'll get through them quickly. Um, the first question is uh, whether the world is now near free trade, and the answer is definitely not, because we've got a big cross-section 
uh, across the country dispersion in rates of assistance to farmers, and we've got a lot of cross-product dispersion within each country as well. Uh, we ha are, have come a huge way towards free trade over the period since reforms began in the mid-80s, but we've come about three-fifths of the way, both in agricultural and non-agricultural trade, but that means we've still got two-fifths to go, so there's a bit more to be had yet. Um, if we were um, uh, to move to free trade, how much more would uh, agriculture be traded internationally? It turns out about five percentage points more. Uh, but that would still leave us at a very low rate. It's currently about 11% of world agricultural production is traded. Uh, in other primary products, it's 42%. In manufacturers, it's 31%. So agriculture is a long way away from being near those other sectors in its tradability uh, at this stage. It's tradable, but it's not being traded because of policy still. We looked at also at to the extent to which poverty and inequality globally and within countries would uh, be affected by removing such uh, remaining distortions. It turns out both would be reduced substantially, so that's a, another plus for the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, there has, has always been this question about whether Asia would starve the world. I think Ash has given us a good answer of India. On the contrary, it's contributing to uh, surpluses beyond its own needs uh, there, and um, China too has been able to main its, maintain its self-sufficiency, so I think the answer here is no, uh, because of supply response, and we've seen in Rashok slides in India the extent to which there is supply response, and also the USDA's forecast showed how quickly farmers had responded to high prices for grains in recent times. Um, so uh, China is doing what other countries did. There's the uh, China, sorry, the China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan uh, rates of protection as their per capita incomes grew, and uh, the question has been whether other countries might follow that. Uh, unfortunately, both uh, China and Indonesia have indeed followed that path, gone from taxing not to a neutral policy stance, but to subsidising agriculture uh, to an extent that is greater now than the average for. Uh, Europe. So uh, that's something to be watched and it's something that uh, the WTO members are watching as we go towards the next uh, trade ministerial meeting in Buenos Aires at the end of this year. Um, how much uh, might agricultural protection growth limit this growth of imports into China? Well, it turns out to uh, be quite a bit. If they wanted to be self-sufficient, to remain self-sufficient, they have been uh, pretty well, except for soybean imports, for example, in recent times. Um, if they wanted to remain self-sufficient, they would have to raise their tariffs hugely when we do projections that include their uh, productivity growth in agriculture plus their incomes growth. You would need tariffs of that order over 100% if you wanted self-sufficiency in those products by 2030. That would be way beyond their WTO commitments. Uh, one hopes Mr Trump won't stir them up to actually try and renege on their, internet, on their WTO obligations and go down that path. Of course, food import dependence doesn't mean uh, a poor national food security. Countries like in, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, of course, are fully import dependent. Uh, it's just a question of how you do it, and China, we've seen, has tried to uh, provide more um, self-reliance, if you like to call it, by investing abroad in agriculture. Um, I'll skip that one just out of time. Um, this is important, I think, and I think Ashok's slides reminded us that if you are a relatively closed economy, then you do get uh, very large fluctuations in price as seasons vary. And so one way to avoid that, of course, is to be more open, uh, to be more open on a permanent basis because that thickens international markets and uh, you get supply responses uh, in, um, to that and that can uh, reduce the extent to which uh, domestic markets are fluctuating and certainly international ones. And this is going to become more important over time as climate change brings more frequent and uh, more violent extreme weather events. Um, so the question now I think is how are we going to try and become more open in agricultural and in other trade uh, as we go forward? And we've seen both the US and the EU uh, struggle politically to get support for this idea, the, U the WTO just hasn't been going anywhere very much, uh, and so uh, with TPP now dead, there's questions about what would happen uh, in Asia. Would Asia pick up here? Would China take some more of a leadership role, for example? Um, the signs are not good for all of that yet. We haven't seen it happen. Let's hope something can happen. 
the Cairns Group, as I mentioned, um, sorry I didn't, but uh, the Cairns Group is pushing for agriculture to be high on the agenda for the WTO ministerial in uh, Argentina at the end of the year and want uh, agricultural domestic supports to be a focus there. So uh, that's one of the, um, the questions. Um, just finally, the, uh, the thing that has often been said is necessary for intervention in domestic uh, economies uh, has been that uh, it's not possible to um, um, secure food for individual households, particularly poor households, without those interventions in prices, in markets for food. Uh, that in fact has changed, and Ashok mentioned it in India, for example, where they're moving away from using price measures to using direct income supports for the poorest households as a much, much cheaper way of doing that. And the ICT revolution has made that possible with countries like India, China, uh, or even the poorest countries in Africa are uh, getting uh, digital uh, accounts for, people are getting digital accounts that allow governments to transfer money to them at a very low cost. So let me uh, leave it there. Um, Lee, there's uh, a couple of books here if anybody's interested. The one on the left is freely available on the uh, University of Adelaide Press website. As an e-book, it was uh, commissioned by DFAT for the Cairns Group and uh, we launched it in Geneva last November. Thanks. Thank you.